the Goodbye Penguins. Today we're going to do FRQ Friday um, from 2018 number two. Um, now before we get too far into it, um, I do want to remind you that the immune system is no longer on the curriculum and that this question was from before um, it was removed from the curriculum, um, but you don't really need to know a lot about the immune system in order to complete this question. Um, so they tell you about these pathogenic bacteria and how they enter, replicate, and spread in other cells, then that causes illness. They then show you this pathway here, and they tell you that the cells normally have this inactive caspase 1, and that it, you know, in response to intracellular uh, pathogens, it's going to become cleaved, um, and that forms active caspase 1, which is our step 1 here. They then tell you that the active caspase 1 can cleave to other proteins. It's going to cleave inactive interleukin 1, and that is going to cause the interleukin to be released. And interleukin will cause some type of immune response. It also tells you that it will cleave the gastrodermin, creating this N-terminal gastrodermin, which forms some type of pore. They then give you this data from this figure. And they say, okay, well, we have these specific proteins that are located in different parts. So, as a student, one of the things that can kind of help you is if you kind of annotate the diagram. As you saw in the previous diagram, I annotated, right? I wrote on it what the, the prompt stated so that I didn't have to keep rereading the prompt. The same thing here. You can kind of think it through what you already know. Well, I know Krebs cycle is going to take place within the mitochondria. I know that the DNA polymerase is part of replication, so that'll take place in the nucleus. I know the GAPDH, although I don't know what that is, it says the glycolytic protein, which means it takes place where glycolysis is, which is that salt or cytoplasm. And then our sodium potassium pump is going to be located on our membrane. And so that kind of can help me as I work through these problems. So the first thing I have to do is describe the effect of inhibiting step three on the formation of pores and on the release of interleukin from the cell. So you're expected to write two different things here. One, you have to talk about how inhibiting step three affects pores, as well as how step three affects the interleukin. So as you see here, if I have this step kind of inhibited, we're not going to go from gastrotermin into this end terminal. That means that we're not going to see any pores forming because this step doesn't take place. Now, in terms of the interleukin, this step, step three, has absolutely nothing to do with step two. So because of the fact that step three has no impact on step two, I'm able to say that there will be no effect on the release of interleukin. And that's what they were looking for. Pores will not form, as well as interleukin release will not be affected. So let's look at what a student says. The student talked about inhibiting step three in the cleavage of the gastrodermin will prevent the association of these proteins, and that would uh, subsequently inhibit the formation of the pores and cell membranes. So the student got the point there. They then said that this will not affect the role of interleukin, or the, I'm sorry, this is the release of interleukin from the cell. And so they got their two points here. Part B talks about making a claim about how cleaving inactive base one results in the activation of caspase one. So they're saying, okay, if I look here at this diagram, right, I see that inactive caspase one has this little black dot, but the active caspase one does not have the little black dot. So that's able to tell me, okay, if I remove this thing from it, that's going to allow it to be active. And so you could talk about removing an inhibitor, a repressor, inhibitory region. And then you could also talk about how removing something is going to change the shape. We know that anytime you bind something to a protein, it always changes shape. I tell my students that constantly, like if you buy something to a protein, then I pause for them and they have to then repeat back to me. It always changes shape. So that's what's going to happen here. The second thing they then say, OK, well, student claims that the pre-infection production of inactive precursors shortens the response time of the cell, provide one reason to support the student's claim. So the student says that if I already have inactive precursors, that means it's going to be faster when the cell is inhib um, sorry, infected by this bacteria. So why would that be true? Well, if I already have the inactive component, all I have to do is take off the inhibitory region and it will be active. That is significantly faster than having to go through the process of transcription of making the RNA and then translation to make a protein. And that's what the pro that's what the they were looking for. Cleaving a precursor is faster than making one upon infection or the cells do not have to wait for transcription and translation in order to have that protein synthesis. And so that is what our kind of, if you're looking at the student's answer, we can see, okay, well, they're talking about that it results in shape change. So they got the point there for the claim. 
They again go on to talk about how if the cell did not constantly produce an active caspase one, the protein would then leave, would have to be transcribed and translated before performing its function, a process which requires more enzymes and more time than just a simple cleavage of a polypeptide. So they're demonstrating that the process of taking off this one little inhibitory region is significantly faster than having to go through transcription translation on its own. So then it says a student claims that the protein is located in cytoplasm until the protein is needed for transcription. Justify the student's claim with evidence. So they're wanting you to use the evidence from this diagram, right? So we're looking here. We can see that the, the different proteins and where they were located. And I had to figure out, okay, well, how can I prove that this protein, which is for my immune response, was located in the cytoplasm and also located somewhere where transcription takes place, which would be the nucleus. Well, the nucleus was right here with our fraction two, but I need to prove that it was in the cytoplasm first. And if you look right here, you see that um, fraction three has that um, GAPDH, that glycolytic protein, which took place in cytosol. So saying that NFKB is in the same place as GAPDF is going to show me that they take place in uh, cytosol and then it moves into the nucleus. Um, so again, stating those two were together, talking about that they were both in cytoplasm would give you the points. So the student mentions it. They said that it's correct because fraction two, the nucleus, and fraction three, the cytosol, tested positive for the NFKB. They then go on to talk about how fraction three is in the cytoplasm because this fragment tested positive for the glycolytic protein. So they're able to make the connection between NFKB and the glycolytic protein being in the cytoplasm. The second part we had to do is identify two fractions. Now, there's only four different fractions here, and you have to identify two. You have a 50% chance of at least guessing one of them. Now, identify just means you have to give me the answer. So you don't have to explain why you picked that answer. So just pick any two. Even if you have no idea, just go ahead and guess two of those fractions and just pick a number. I think it's in fraction one and four, whatever the numbers you think. But we want to think about why it's at that place. We're saying that where would I find it? Well, of course, I'm going to have to find it in the cytoplasm because that's where the protein is going to be made. And then I'm going to have to see that it moves to the um, plasma membrane, which is where we see the sodium potassium pump. So I would expect to see it in three and four because the fact that three is in cytosol, four is in the uh, plasma membrane. And so I need to see it going from the cytosol to the plasma membrane. So the students said that at the very end, they said that the terminal gastrodormin will be found in fractions three and four. Notice that this is a complete sentence. I tell my students that even if it says identify, to still write these into complete sentences. Don't just write the words because um, sometimes it's accepted, sometimes it's not. And this will ensure that you get the point is if you write it in a complete sentence. So part D says to describe the most likely effect of the gastrodermin pore formation on water balance in a hypotonic environment. So real quick before we get into this, a lot of times students have trouble with hypotonics. I wanted to mention it real fast. So hypotonic means that I have a high amount of free water and a low amount of solute versus hypertonic means that I have a high amount of solute and a low amount of free water. Everything always moves from high to low. So the water can move from where there's a high concentration of free water to where there's a low concentration of free water. It moves from hypotonic to hypertonic. And so if I have the gastrodermin pore, this pore that's going to allow some um, substance in, it's nonspecific, then we're going to see that in the hypotonic environment, water is going to rush into my cell. And so the water will then enter the cell. Um, so the student mentions this. They talk about it in the hypotonic environment. Um, the water is going to move into the cell. They then talk about this higher water potential. Um, but all you had to say was that the water was going to enter the cell. So then the last part we have is explain how gastrodermin pore formation and interleukin release contribute to the organism's defense against bacterial pathogen. Now, this point probably is not accessible now with the new curriculum, but let's still talk about it. So gastrodermin pore formation, again, we have these pores that allows the water to rush in. If the water rushes into my cell, we're in a hypertonic environment, water rushes in, my cell is going to burst um, and that causes the bacteria to have no you know, host cell. You can also talk about the interleukin release. Interleukin, it says, activates the immune system. The problem is you have to be very specific in this. You can't just restate the prompt. The prompt told us interleukin helped with the activating of the immune system. So you would have to give me a specific part of the immune system. It activates white blood cells. It activates um, 
B cells, T cells, and tell me what happens with those. So the B cells will, of course, produce the antibodies. The cytotoxic T cells will um, puncture a hole in the cell, all that fun stuff. So you had to mention cell lysis from our gastrodermin, and then interleukin then stimulates the immune system cells. And the student mentioned that cause the infected cell to burst. This would prevent the spread of the infection. And then they talk about the spread of inter, I'm sorry, the release of interleukin activates the adaptive immune system by stimulating B and T leukocytes.